Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're here at CDOIQ. This is The Cube. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host, Sanjeev Mohan. Paul, Paul Gillen will be here tomorrow as well. Anthony Dayton is here as the CEO of Tamer. Anthony, welcome. Great to be here. Nice to see you again. Yeah, ditto. Uh, we newly minted, eh, relatively, started in January. Uh, we first uh, talked to Tamer when Michael Stonebreaker came on at this very event, which was at the Tang Center at the time in uh, late last decade. Uh, give us the update on Tamer. What's happening there? Sure, so, and the, the fact that you brought up Mike uh, is a great, a great point. So, uh, Tamer comes out of academic research uh, from around, literally around the corner here yeah, at right. MIT. Mike, uh, uh, the academic uh, co-founder. In a way, the idea behind Tamer is very, very simple, which is, what if we could train AI to do common data management tasks? Mm things we're good at as people. If I show you two customer records and I say, are these the same? As a human being, you're like, yeah, those are the same, or no, those are different. Uh, if I show you a phone number and I say, does this look like a valid phone number to you? As a human, we're very good at saying, yeah, that looks valid, or no, that doesn't look valid. What if we could train a machine to do those tasks? Uh, what would that open up? How would that allow us to improve the quality of our enterprise data? And the one thing that we can be 100% confident, the one theme that I see repeated uh, constantly and with certainty at this conference is my enterprise data is a post-apocalyptic dumpster fire <laughs> and I need to get a handle on it. And uh, you know, I've got great tooling for visualization, I have great tooling for accessing the data, but the data itself is terrible. Uh, so Tamer is focused on the problem of helping organizations improve the quality of their enterprise data by using AI to identify the entities that exist in those data and allowing them to publish the best versions of that data at any given time. So why is that the case? I mean, we got to, the, the BI industry was created ostensibly to solve this problem, or maybe, maybe to create a veneer, false veneer on top of the problem. It's about a $30 billion business. Sure. We've got beautiful dashboards and visualizations. We have these hyper-specialized data pipelines that, that that serve the business. Why is data still such a mess? Because fundamentally, data is a scale problem. And by the way, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the BI and analytics companies have solved an extraordinarily important and frankly difficult problem, which is how do I give people easy to use access to that data? But I hear this consistently from customers. Actually, I love my dashboards, I don't believe the data that's in them, right? <laughs> and so, um, why is it, and to your point, why is it that we haven't solved the data problem? It's because it's a scale problem. So if I had um, a simple example, if I had a 10 million customer records and I wanted to understand if there are any duplicates in that customer record, I have to take the first record and I have to compare it with the 9,999,999 other records that it could be. And if you do that work, you're going to have around 50 trillion comparisons mm -hmm. that you have to do. It's what we call in computer science an n squared problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's an overwhelming problem, and as a result, you don't do it. But AI hacks the scale problem. So now we can actually ask the machine to go do that work on our behalf. It doesn't sleep, it doesn't eat, it works weekends, it's highly parallelizable. And we can actually attack this problem. For the first time ever, arguably, we can actually get a handle on this problem. It's interesting, I was just looking, I was mentioned uh, Mike Stonebreaker was on early, uh, late last decade, and one of the things he said, this is obviously well before you, you know, the uh, yeah, AI yeah, awakening, correct. the AI yeah, heard yeah. around the world. He said, the second thing I'd like you to know is, is, and really stress is machine learning is going to be a game changer for essentially everybody. And not only is it going to be autonomous vehicles, it's going to be automatic checkout, drone delivery, and so you can, you can uh, uh, basically affect everybody and categorically any job is going to get automated, and that was you know late last decade, it's pretty life prescient. Is prescient. Yes, yeah, and it, it, was, it was clear. And we also talked about master data management. And I had mentioned, you know, so don't hate me for saying this, but the the database that you basically invented, and the data warehouses, and 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 the the big data never lived up mm -hmm. to the promise. Master data management Great. as well. A lot of promises made by the technology industry. Uh, and, and his point was, we're going to solve that. How are you solving that, uh, and wh why is it going to be different this time? Well, so first of all, uh, go back to the premise of the question. Uh, the MDM industry has 
has failed. I, I, I don't, I've never met anyone that put their hand up and said, yeah, I just got uh, you know, t uh, staffed onto an MDM project, super excited, right? It's like, <laughs> no, that, that doesn't, you know. Yeah, um, it's a very high failure rate, MDM projects. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that's fundamentally because we've asked people to go and take on this task. And as we said, it's a scale problem. So we're asking people to do boring work at scale. Well, shocker, they don't like doing that. Um, the, the opportunity and the, you know, why is it different this time? Well, uh, to, to the point you brought up, Mike and the academic team at MIT, they've invented machine learning. They can now take this problem and turn it over largely to the computer. So if we can take a corpus of data and we can have 95, 99, 99.9% .9 of the data cleaned, curated, brought together, the entities identified so we know what companies exist in that data, what customers exist in that data, what suppliers exist in that data. We can do that automatically. If the machine can do that, then the edge cases that we leave on, you know, that aren't perfect, that we turn those over to people, they're happy to take that on. That's, that's interesting work. Let's go figure out where these, you know, these weird edge cases are. But we need to take 95, 99% of that work and have the machine do it uh, on your behalf. So I have a question. Earlier on, you were talking about uh, data quality is an issue, and so, so what is the connection between data quality, MDM, entity resolution, uh, are these all related? They're all related, and in a way, they're all uh, answering the same question, which is, what's the best version of this type of data that I have inside my enterprise? And, and I'm using this term type a little bit uh, in the colloquial, so is it, what is the best customer data? What is the best supplier data? What's the best parts data? What's the best product data? So we all have these common ideas inside our company about the data that matters to me as a business. Um, and the question is, how do we identify those, the term we would use as entities or the type of data, identify those types of data, and then within that domain, what is the best version of any given record across every source and internal sources, external sources, structured sources, unstructured sources. I want all of that information brought together. And the only way we're going to solve this problem, the only way we're going to solve this problem is with AI. That is not a human scalable problem. That's what we talked about before. Now, what kind of AI? Are we talking about yeah. legacy AI and you know, machine learning that Michael uh, Stonebreaker talked about? Are we talking about you know, LLMs and generative AI, both? How are they being applied? What's your perspective on that? Sure. So, um, first of all, uh, just some definitions. AI is a very general topic, which is, as the, <laughs> as the acronym is, it's artificial intelligence. It's really the application of algorithms to uh, any sort of task. Hmm. Um, machine learning uh, and, uh, is a specific instance of AI, and large language models are a specific instance of AI. These things work very well together. What large language models are so good at is um, generating, cons either generating but also consuming text. Um, and that can be very valuable in the context of some of the AI algorithms that we've developed uh, at Tamer. Uh, so for example, if I give you a description of a part, which is a long string of text, and I want to extract from that some piece of information, so I give you a, a description of the part, and it says, this is a seven millimeter ball bearing, and I ask, well, what's the size of the ball bearing? It'll say seven millimeters. It's good at that sort of task. Uh, also in reverse, if I hand it uh, a structured uh, um, JSON object of the customer data, and I say, can you summarize everything we know yeah. about this customer? Or write an email. Or write an email. Yeah. These are tasks that large language models are good at. On the other hand, large language models, and Mike will talk about this uh, on Friday at this conference, but large language models are not good at um, resolving entities. Mm -hmm. well, there's a specific domain that we can, you know, a specific type of technology that's really good at that. But all of these things work well together, and they all fit under this moniker of AI. Okay, and, and coming back to what you're doing, you're applying this, this sort of all these different elements of AI mm -hmm. to scale the MDM problem. It, yes, to, to slay the MDM beast yeah, finally. Not scale the problem, but, but <laughs> yes, to, finally, but to, uh, to, to, to scale the, the success, the outcome, yeah. a successful outcome. Um, so go ahead, please. I, I've followed Tamer for many years mm -hmm. as an analyst, and I've seen that every few years, Tamer will change its 
value proposition. Uh, so what is now the current state and how is Tamer now getting a like product market fit? Sure, so really focused on this problem of entity resolution at scale to solve the MDM problem. Uh, entirely a SaaS solution, okay. so you don't need to install anything or you know, configure mm -hmm. anything. Simply use uh, Tamer Cloud, uh, point it at the sources of data that hmm. you have, and the system will identify the key entities that matter and the data within those entities that are relevant to your business. Um, so, yeah, in a way, um, really making it simple. Uh, and finally being able to get a handle on this MDM problem. Irrespective so, of the physical location of the data? Correct. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. But is there, a, uh, do your customers have an issue, is the data being moved? Or is it staying within my account? So Yeah, so it's very much, it's very important that it stays within your account and it's your data. Hmm. Um, the, the question of how we resolve those entities, clearly we need to apply the model to the data. Hmm. Um, and so, uh, and we can't expect uh, source systems to do that work. It would put far yeah. too much load on those Correct. sources. And plus the types of calculations that we're doing are fairly, uh, uh, you know, Compute complicated. Intensive. Yeah, compute intensive. Yeah. Um, so absolutely that we want all of that processing to exist uh, in our cloud and we want it to be, hmm. you know, encrypted and secure and, you know, isolated, et cetera. So those are all uh, important questions. But fundamentally, you know, it comes back to outcomes. If we can take, uh, tens, hundreds, thousands of sources of data and show you your customers, your suppliers, your parts, your products, these key entities that matter to your business and deliver those to your business decision makers, maybe through a dashboard that mm -hmm. allows beautiful visualization, but finally a dashboard that you actually trust the answers in, that's the holy grail, that's what we can achieve, finally. What are you talking about at this conference? You, uh, there's this term virtual chief data officer, what, what does that mean? Uh, how does it relate to the, the chief AI officer role that's emerging? Yeah, so the question I asked and that presented on at uh, CDOIQ, I wanted to sort of explore this question of whether AI in a way disrupts the chief data officer's job. Um, and in some ways this comes back to, I think, a fundamental uh, concern or anxiety that maybe everybody has, which is, is AI coming for my job? And mm -hmm. given this was a CDO conference, I sort of asked the question, well, is AI coming for the CDO's job? Hmm. Um, and Great in a sure. good way, the answer is, well, yes and no. So It depends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Almost every segment we are recording today, the answer is it depends. It depends. So <laughs> what does it depend on? So um, a lot of the work that we see CDOs doing are really answering basic questions how many employees do we have? What's this customer doing? Can you tell me where this supplier is located? You know, these are basic questions. And frankly, having a, a, a CDO team or a, a CDO themselves answering those questions is a, is a waste of human capital, right? Those are questions the AI should be able to answer. Uh, and using Tamer and our virtual chief data officer capability, we can, the, the term of art here is, uh, retrieval augmented generation or RAG, we can pass to the LLM the entity data that's relevant mm -hmm. to the question that's being asked, and we can give people a natural interface to be able to ask and answer those questions. That we think is extremely exciting, and it's a way of making uh, the, the, the work that Tamer does of identifying these entities relevant to, to users, and we think takes this boring work that CDOs have yeah. asked to do, takes it off the table and allows them to focus on the, the strategy of the business. I mean, it would seem to me that what gets disrupted, I'd love both of your, your input on this, the, the data pipelines today are highly complex. They're, mm -hmm. they're comprised of extremely specialized individuals, uh, data engineers, quality engineers, uh, data scientists, business analysts, that rely on each other and all, in, a, in many cases, a very linear you can't do anything until the, the, the new data gets in and it's clean and so yep. forth. A lot of heavy lifting. I would think AI disrupts that so, quite dramatically. But Yeah, so my point of view is that the, more than 50% of CDO's job, daily function, should be in uh, orchestrating all these different teams, shepherding what they're doing, building consensus, getting buy-in, understanding uh, 
where the problems exist, fix and you know, and directing LLMs towards that. If 50% of uh, a CDO's job is people related, that's not going to be disrupted by LLM. But the other 40% or 30%, which is the boring, heavy lifting of go run this algorithm and Can find you share these. this, extract this data from you? And yes, share that, yeah. that should be uh, disrupted by LLM. But okay, not all the people. The, okay, yeah. all the boring stuff. So if I want to, so Anthony, you gave some examples, some pretty straightforward examples that the machine should be able to take care of. But if I want to understand how a, a variety of pricing actions are going to affect my revenue, mm -hmm. um, you're saying you're still going to need the, the people. I to, would to not that. give that uh, critical job to an LLM today. Maybe, maybe a few years from now, I, I'm not going to put my company's revenue at stake uh, but, but fast but, forward a few years. Right? But the, the key to answering that question, so you're asking the question, what would a change in price do for my gross margins or my revenue? Uh, the key to answering that question is the underlying data yeah, associated sure. with answering that. Yeah. If mm -hmm. I have all my customer data as a mess, or if I'm only looking at customer data for North America because I haven't figured out how to link it to customer data in Europe, yeah. I'm answering that question with, you know, with one hand tied behind my back. And so we believe that the key to seeing the success of any kind of analytical process inside a company and the one you, you know, like building a model for pricing uh, is a great example, is clean, quality, curated, trusted entity data at the, corner, at the, at the core of that model. Uh, otherwise, you're at risk of hallucinating. And th this is a really important point, which is in our personal lives, if we go and interact with ChatGPT or Gemini from Google, and it hallucinates an answer. We go, ha, 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 we laugh, yeah. we tell a funny story. Yeah. Uh, if we're in our company and we rely on one of these models to do an analysis and it hallucinates an answer, it can be catastrophic. We could be you know, pricing incorrectly. We could be giving away a discount we didn't need to give. We could be uh, saying the wrong thing to a customer. So the key to all of this is the quality of our enterprise data and the, this problem, this quality of data problem, is fundamentally a scale problem. There's too much data to take it on manually. Yeah. So, you, you brought up RAG. Um, we know a little bit about RAG. We developed our own RAG, the Cube AI, cubeai.com, released it earlier this year in sort of a little per beta. I have data from our survey, from ETR. Mm -hmm. They just did a survey, 1,400 respondents. I was somewhat surprised at this. Which of the following best describes your organization's plans for incorporating ret retrieval augmented generation into your organization's Gen AI strategy? 28% of those 1,400 said no plans. 22% currently experimenting. Only 4% said they're going to roll out in the next six months. And only 3% said they have RAG in production. 23% said they're not sure. I was surprised given that's, that's very that it was pretty trivial for us yeah. to take, we have good data, because when you come to the cube, there's not a lot of racial bias, you're not swearing, sure. you know, you know so it's pretty you know, tight data set. Um, but it really is a semi-trivial request response type of model. Um, first of all, do those numbers surprise you at all? Only 7% plan on rolling this out or have it in production. I, I'm actually quite surprised. That's a really low number. So I wonder if it's just talking to the wrong people. But. And, and the fact that you are saying that you've got drag and for you it's like, what's a big deal? You should have drag. I think it also depends upon the kind of data and questions you're asking. So it's the data quality and what's the use case? Your data is mostly videos right. and text. And Transcripts, yeah. Right, so so putting an LLM and asking similarity kind of questions and probabilistic is okay. But you were saying there could be catastrophic uh, issues when you're asking data that uh, questions that should really go to a deterministic model on structured data. So I, I think we need to understand what is the usage. But, you, but Anthony, you were saying you actually use RAG. Sure. And so how do you address that, that problem? So, so I think it's because uh, this strategy and these, and these terms, frankly, are very cutting edge. 
you know, Tamer is still a relatively small business. Uh, we have yet to dominate every single Fortune 500 company. We are thrilled and excited about the opportunity to, to give everyone in the world the, the best uh, you know, rag models on top of their enterprise data. But it, you know, we're, it's early days and, and we're going to get there. I think most companies in the world are just experimenting with, frankly, large language models and seeing what the possibilities are. Uh, and that's why you see the data. So that doesn't surprise you as much as it no. does. Some you know, the, the, other, the other thing I want to mention is that we are, we have, why do we have rag? Because uh, it's, we are limited by the context windows of mm -hmm. the model, uh, and we haven't yet developed the full breadth of technology for AI. Once we develop that, then the value of RAG may actually go down. I don't think it's going to go away, but there will be other opportunities, like you know, million uh, uh, context length uh, window, for example, may not need drag. Now, right now, it's called it's too expensive yeah. and latency. <laughs> Guys, we got to yeah. we got to leave it there. Anthony, thanks so much for coming on. Sanjeev, my co-host uh, uh, for today, and hopefully tomorrow, tomorrow as well. We got some yeah. other guests coming on as well, so you'll be here. Paul Gillen will be here as well. Keep it right here. My name is Dave Vellante. You're watching theCUBE's coverage of CDIOQ 2024 from Cambridge, Massachusetts. We'll be right back. Thank you.